The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. At the time of recording this interview, the war in Gaza rages on. Since October 7, when more than 1,139 Israelis were killed and another 240 were taken hostage, Israel vowed to destroy Hamas. The atrocities of that day also severely challenged Israeli's sense of compassion for Palestinians. In Palestine, the death toll is also horrifying. More than 30,000 Palestinians are believed to have died, and another 72,000 have been injured. The war and the humanitarian crisis that has resulted has brought calls from around the world for a ceasefire. The government of Benjamin Netanyahu shows little interest, however, in heeding those calls. The level of hate and anger that existed before October 7th continues to rise, which leads to the longer-term question, can peace ever be achieved? Giddy Grinstein, the founder of the Reut Institute in Tel Aviv, says, maybe, but the conditions have to be ripe. He continues, it won't be easy. Millions of Israelis and Palestinians do not want to live in the same country, much less a shared society. I invited Giddy Grinstein, the co-author of Insights, to join me for a conversation that matters about possible paths forward for Israel and Palestine. Giddy, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. This book was published uh, in the months leading up to the events of October 7th. Um, why did you write it? Uh, because it, it is an examination of the peace process that started under the Clinton administration in 1993 through the Oslo agreements and then the final push by Clinton to try and uh, uh, develop a lasting peace. Uh, why was it important to write this book now? So our book was actually published, when I say our, together with my co-author, Professor Arya Filala of Rutgers University. Uh, our book was actually published on September 6th. So that's seven days a week before September 13th, which would have marked 30 years since the signing of the first Oslo Accord. That was signed on September 13, 1993. Um, and it's also a, during a very important week, what I call the Peace Week, because on September 15, 2000, um, the Abraham Accords were signed, and on September 17, 1978, um, the, the first Camp David Accords, the Israel-Egypt Camp David Accord was signed also. So we have all these big milestones in one week, and I wanted my our book to actually frame the conversation in this, uh, toward the, this uh, event. I have to say that our book emphasizes that whatever happened when I was part of the negotiation team between 1999 and 2001 was part of the process that began in 1978, 1979 in the Camp David Accords between Israel and Egypt, continued through the Oslo Accords, and continued and continues until today in the Abraham, in the, with the signing of the Abraham Accords in 2000. Not only that, the key principles of the peace process that were introduced by Israel and Egypt in 1978, 79, by the way, the milestone for the 1979 Accord is coming up March 26. Um, so the, the principles that were established then are still shaping the political process, even now during an, and, uh, out the war and as we think about the day after the war. So uh, this is sort of the background. But the other thing that, my, that Ari and I felt is that the people who were leading this process have basically moved on. Some retired. Some unfortunately passed away, some moved to other tasks, and the knowledge has been disappearing. And therefore, because we believe that at some point, Israelis and Palestinians will have to re-engage on the long-term future of their relations, we had to bring together the wisdom that is associated with managing such a complex political process in one place. I had two people in mind, Ari and I, when we wrote the book. The first is the Israeli chief negotiator, and the second person is the head of the American National Security Council that is tasked by the president to lead a political process. These are the two individuals that we had in mind when we wrote the book. And our vision was that when, when the National Security Advisor of the United States gets the book, he looks at it and he says, you know what, that's a keeper. I could put it on the shelf and I'll bring it down when I need it. And I think they need it now. So 
in light of, of course, the events of October the 7th, how relevant is the book at the moment where it looks like getting to uh, peace negotiations is a long way off? So basically getting to a peace negotiation is a long way off. But right now we're talking about the political horizon and we're talking about the day after. And these two, let's call it slogans of, you know, political horizon and the day after brings together a lot of the issues that were negotiated in the past. For example, there is a call for the withdrawal of UNRWA, the UN Relief and Works Agency that was created by the United Nations to preserve the Palestinian refugee problem. So now... Israel is calling for UNRWA's withdrawal, and indeed UNRWA also, in my view, has been a very negative force in terms of our ability to move toward peaceful coexistence between Israelis and Palestinians. But how to withdraw UNRWA? The, a lot of the answers are in our book. In, for example, um, a key principle for withdrawing UNRWA is simply saying that the responsibilities of UNRWA and the funding of UNRWA together as a package should go to the Palestinian Authority that could replace UNRWA. But in order to do that, another thing is essential, and that is that the people that UNRWA serves, that are considered, quote unquote, refugees, should become citizens and residents of the would-be Palestinian state. And at that point, once we have a Palestinian state or moving in the direction of a Palestinian state, it's kind of ludicrous to think about a condition of a Palestinian refugee in a Palestinian state. Meaning if those two things happen, there is a political horizon of Palestinian statehood and there is a transfer of the resources and responsibilities of UNRWA to the Palestinian Authority as the governing body of the West Bank and Gaza, at that point we can begin to withdraw UNRWA. That insight emanates directly from the book and it's one of dozens, perhaps hundreds of insights that are relevant today. Got to get you to hang on for a second while we take a quick commercial break. We'll be right back. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. So getting to a two-state solution uh, has been uh, unachievable at the moment. But you wrote just recently uh, that there would be value in the United States unilaterally uh, declaring that the Palestinian Authority become a nascent state. Uh, and you also note that the UK, David Cameron, has uh, indicated that there would, might be support for that idea from, from uh, London as well. Uh, why, is it, why would this be an important next step? First of all, um, the Palestinian Authority today already meets most of the criteria by international law for being a state, meaning they have a territory, they have a population, it's a legitimate government that govern, governs them, even if there are all sorts of caveats about when that government was elected and corruption. In most other countries around the world, that doesn't deny the right to statehood. So most of the at attributes of statehood already exist. What's missing? What's missing is that Israel would recognize the Palestinian Authority as a state and the United States will do as well. Now, there's uh, so it's very hard to kind of introduce another step, another layer between where the Palestinian Authority is now and being a full-fledged statehood. And that's where the nascent state comes in. Nascent state is a concept in international law about a political entity that will for sure become a state, meaning it's the, the final, the permanent status of statehood is guaranteed. But there is a process along the way. For example, Israel was recognized, Israel's right to statehood was recognized on November 29, 1947, but Israel only became a state in May 1948. In those six months, Israel was a nascent state. So I am trying to just create a little bit of room, flexibility for the diplomatic maneuvering by introducing the concept of a nascent state. That, there, it, this is a concept that will give all Palestinians a very clear message. You will be a state by a given target date or, or when certain conditions are met. Now for the United States and Arab countries, by the way, to say that opens the door for a range of other steps that could be taken. First of all, I've, we've already discussed about the potential potential withdrawing of, of UNRWA and the beginning of the resolution of the refugee issue. The second thing is it makes legitimate the claim that Gaza and the West Bank are a single territorial unit. And then it allows for a process of reforming and upgrading the Palestinian Authority because it is going to be a state. So there is a process that of elevating their capacities 
which will be essential for their ability to take over Gaza, which is the only possible pot- political solution to the void, to the vacuum, to the Somalia-type environment that is now emerging in Gaza because Israel will not take responsibility and Israel denies the right of, denies the claim, denies Hamas from taking responsibility for Gaza. So the only entity that could come in there is the Palestinian Authority. Also, once we have that, we can begin to build an economic package, a rebuilding package. It is estimated that the rebuilding of Gaza will cost between 20 to 30 billion dollars. And of course, if you rebuild Gaza, you can't ignore the West Bank. So an estimate of 40 billion dollars will be needed. Someone needs to manage this money. Someone needs to ma- needs to provide the services to do the planning and zoning, even if the UAE and Saudi and other generous countries around the world are willing to put in the billions. There is some authority that needs to decide where the roads will be and where the schools and all that can only be done by local Palestinian governments. So this actually unlocks the process in many ways. Um, and I believe it's an essential, it's a good step to begin to move us back in track and hopefully toward mutual trust. As you said in your opening remarks, the events of October 7th, the atrocities of October 7th that have placed Israel under a condition of sustained trauma. Of course, the world is now looking on the Palestinian side, kind of assuming that Israelis moved on, but that's not the case. In Israel, and I go there frequently, I'll be there next week, I was there two weeks ago, Israel is in a state of deep trauma because of October 7th, and therefore the process of coming back to, toward a place where you can see the other side, compassionate to the other side, know that on the other side there are people that also want peace, and they're the partners of, the, of, of us on the Israeli side who believe in peace uh, and coexistence. All that will be gradual, so we need to start somewhere, and I think that's a good place to start with, meaning recognizing that the Palestinian Authority recognizing the Palestinian Authority as a nascent state, acknowledging that it will be a state, and beginning to build a path toward that end, end state. I also found it very interesting that you spoke about, uh, by recognizing uh, the PA as a nascent state, uh, that the negotiations around territory can move to uh, be encompassed or uh, uh, coordinated by the United Nations. Uh, why is this is an important component in being able to move towards what would be those right uh, conditions to create a lasting actually, peace? Actually, it's kind of a, um, I'm I'm making two arguments here. The first yeah. is that the only possible agreed reference point for future borders is UN Security Council Resolution 242, which was agreed upon between Israel and Egypt, and then agreed upon between. Uh, Israel and the Palestinians in all existing agreements. And therefore, that uh, reference point is the only uh, um, possible framework for future borders. Also, the advantage of UN Security Council Resolution 242 is that it has two translations. The French translation is aligned with the Palestinian understanding of the decision, And the English translation is aligned with the Israeli understanding of that decision. The difference is that according to the French translation, Israel has to withdraw from all the territories that it took over in 1967. And according to the English version of that decision, Israel only has to withdraw from parts of the areas that were taken over in 1967. Meaning when you refer to 242, to UN Security Council Resolution 242, you're preserving and sustaining this kind of constructive ambiguity that allows both sides to move on. And that, I believe, is is very important right now because, as I mentioned uh, earlier, there is a condition of deep mistrust, distrust between the parties. I will say, though, that once we do that, the second phase is to actually acknowledge that the territorial arrangements were created in the Oslo Accords that divide the area in the West Bank into Area A, full control by the Palestinian Authority, Area B, roughly 22%. Area A is 18% of the West Bank. Area B is 22% of the West Bank. Security controlled by Israel, civilian controlled by the Palestinians. And then Area C, roughly 60% of the West Bank, fully controlled by Israel. This arrangement could be applied in Gaza, meaning most of Gaza will be Area A, controlled by the Palestinian Authority. And the perimeter of Gaza that is essential for Israeli security could be declared as Area B. 
Again, this is kind of uh, um, offers benefits for both sides because it means that Israel will have control, security control over the perimeter of Gaza to prevent another October 7 from happening. But it also guarantees the Palestinians that all of the territory of Gaza, based on the 1967 lines, will be Palestine at some point in the future. So again, what I'm trying to think about are all these formulas that give both sides some of what they need in order to be able to move forward. This is our second break. We'll be back in a moment. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. You've also written about what the peace dividend uh, or seeming peace dividend out of the Oslo process has been in Israel. Do you foresee that same dividend uh, being applied to Palestine if we can get to this point where we have a sustained peace? 100%. I think that the Palestinians have been fighting for almost 100 years for their own right to self-determination. I subscribe to the view that, um, you know, I avoid the debate whether the Palestinians were a people prior to the 1940s and so on. This is a debate for historians. For sure now, for the last few decades, they have their own distinct political and social identity, and they want their right to self-determination, which in many ways is undeniable. So having a state will, will allow to realize the right of self-determination. I hope that such a state coming into being will be tied to a massive economic package that will allow them to embark on a path of economic prosperity. Look, I go uh, every once in a while to the UAE and to Dubai and Abu Dhabi, and, and, and these are countries with tremendous, uh, yes, they were, they were lucky in terms of the resources that they found in the ground. But the most important asset that they have is their leadership, a leadership that comes with a vision for society, that drives the development of society, that seeks to serve all members of society, and so on. Not everything is about the resources. And I think that hopefully the Palestinians will find that kind of energy in them to build their state alongside Israel. And, and you know, I know it sounds crazy, it sounds out of touch today, but with that state, Israel and Palestine, we could do big things together in the world. Well, I find it interesting that you touch on the, the idea of the natural resources under the ground, but I believe that the most valuable resource to any society is the collective intelligence of the people who live within that society and what they choose to do with their, with their ability. So when we take a look at what happened in Israel post uh, the Oslo process, uh, there was a tremendous amount of intellectual investment in high tech and uh, biotech into Israel. This is possible for the entire region, is it not? Yes. I mean, I, think, I do think that the environment in Israel is unique for a number of reasons. First of all, it's the kind of the Israeli character that, and books have been written about it, like Startup Nation and The Genius of Israel and uh, uh, Thou Shall Innovate. Uh, all these books have been written to describe this very unique phenomena that allows Israel to be really outstanding in terms of its performance in the field of innovation. And as we all know, as the French like to say, the edge of the guillotine sharpens the mind. So there is that element as well. We've been living on the edge of the abyss and we had to make it happen. So all these things are unique, but I do think that uh, uh, the resourcefulness um, is something, the benefits of these innovations could actually lift both societies. Um, again, it requires vision, it requires leadership, but it can happen. Um, and many Palestinians can benefit from the fact that Israeli... Listen, uh, listen just uh, on, on December 2022, less than a year and a half ago, Israel was recognized by The Economist as one of the four leading economies in the world. This is incredible. And that could spill over to many others around us. And by the way, it has through the in the, through technology. But I'm talking also about higher quality of living and so on. And we have to also remember one more thing. In the West Bank, with all the qualifications and all the reservations, the Palestinian Authority has been on relatively good terms with Israel. And therefore, in the West Bank, there is relative prosperity. In Gaza, they took the path of fighting Israel over and over and over again, and they the condition there is very um, poor. Uh, by the way, 
one of the interesting discoveries during this war is that Gaza is not as poor as we thought. And now that the Israeli forces are there and we see the testimonies, there was wealth in Gaza. There were wealthy people in Gaza. You could buy uh, brands in Gaza. You know, there was a whole layer of people that made a fortune by its association with Hamas. But uh, but now that's... And, and, but I think it's also very important to remember that in the weeks and months, effectively two years, leading up to the war, Israel gradually opened the border and you had thousands of Palestinians daily coming into Israel for work, business people coming for, to do business, and traders using Israeli ports, airports and seaports to, to, you know, to, to move their, uh, their products, especially agricultural products, from Gaza to the shelves in supermarkets in Europe within a day, within 24 hours. So what I'm saying is hopefully out of this war, we will come up with a new security regime that will allow us to reignite, it will take time, this kind of economic and business collaboration for the benefit of everybody. Third and final break. We'll be right back. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. It will take a collective will on both sides to uh, set aside hatred. Um, you know, as you have noted, there are millions of Palestinians and millions of Israelis that do not want to share the same country, let alone a shared culture. How do we move beyond that? First of all, there are a few things we don't want to share, but there are a few things that we have to share. For example, the environment. Um, Tom Friedman has re written extensively about it. So um, in referencing to his articles, he, he writes about the sewage of Gaza blocking the desalination sites in Israel. And why? Because the, the, the currents of the Mediterranean go from Gaza along the Israeli coast. So if the sewage system in Gaza doesn't work, we have a problem in Israel. If uh, there is uh, illnesses in Gaza, we have, uh, and if the Gazan people are not able to take care of their animals and their dogs and so on, those things cross the border into Israel. Uh, if there is a water crisis in Gaza, Israel will have to send more water into Gaza and so on. I think this war it has created a horrific environmental damage to, uh, in Gaza and that environmental damage in and of itself will be will require a lot of mutual efforts to fix. So what I'm well, saying is, yes, there are things that separate us, but there are also things that inevitably unite us. And uh, uh, we all share a, a, you know, a segment of the Middle East, us Israelis and Palestinians. We have, and there are issues that inevitably force us to work together. And well, again, I have to say, all of this depends on, on our ability, um, I'm saying this as an Israeli, of course, on our ability to move past Hamas. Hamas is the enemy of peace. Every time, including in Manx, that we got close to a breakthrough, Hamas intervened using strategic terrorism to derail the process. In the 1990s, we were signing agreements, and then there was a wave of terrorism led by Hamas that destroy the peace process and put it on hold for a few years. In 2000, we were getting close to an agreement, and again, Hamas torpedoed the process. In 2002, the Arab, peace in, the Arab League, not even Israelis, declares its peace initiative. Two, three days later, suicide bombing, bombings in plural, and that whole thing is now derailed. And I think you cannot disconnect the fact, the timing of the attack on October 7 with the progress, progressing of Israel and Saudi toward a normalization agreement. So we're seeing over and over again, Hamas is uh, a brutal enemy of peace. They will stop at nothing to prevent this kind of uh, rapprochement between Israel and Palestinians and also Israel and Arab countries. So in my view, if at the end of this war, Hamas is not in power, and doesn't have the military capability, remember that Hamas is an illegal militia even according to Palestinians, there are illegal militia within Palestine. So if those things are gone, I think we can actually have an opportunity to move toward peace that we could not have imagined on October 6. This is the paradox of the situation. We could move to very worse, but we could also move to the biggest opportunity we've seen in many years. 
Well, I hope you're uh, correct about the positive potential outcome. Thank you very much for your time today and for sharing your insights into the complexity and potential paths forward. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much for having me.